Hello, everybody. It's good to see you. And uh, glad that uh, we were able to get together with you again tonight. Oh, just a couple of things as we're starting out. A reminder that uh, this is on uh, Facebook uh, for a while, and uh, then it's also on YouTube as long as uh, YouTube will allow us to continue to rack up videos over the years. We've racked up quite a few. Um, but uh, anyways, if you're here on Facebook, uh, I invite you to check in, uh, use the comments section, say hello. Uh, use the uh, likes, uh, the notification likes or whatever you call that, and uh, let us know that you've been watching if you don't want to say hello. Uh, also, if this is on YouTube, uh, like and subscribe is a great way to help us to get more visibility on YouTube. Uh, so if you think that this is worthwhile and uh, you think others that ought to see it, uh, please do that. It would be a big, big help to us. Um, anyway, uh, some folks have been asking about my granddaughter, um, Donna Marie Joy, buddy, um, and um, she uh, was born early in the morning, uh, about, what, 2.24 and uh, a.m., and uh, she's in the NICU currently. Um, her lungs were underdeveloped, but uh, they project that she'll be fine, um, however, you know, we always ask for folks to pray. I'm sure that you folks have prayers, uh, prayer needs on your end too. So we're going to pause a few minutes, uh, just quickly saying hi to Tim, saying hi to, uh, <laughs> saying hi to Daryl. Thanks, Tim. Uh, that's, a, that's a good name, Grandpa. I like that name. I wear it well. Uh, let's pray together, okay? Uh, let's look to the Lord. Merciful Father, we come before you because this is a time set aside for the Bible to be unfolded before us, for you to give us more understanding that is consistent with the rest of the scripture. I pray, Father, you would help us because it's so easy for us to take things out of context depending on what mood or what vein of thought we're in at a given time and to uh, read the scripture as applying to this or that situation of life when uh, actually it has an original uh, meaning and an original uh, communication and is not intended for us to be uh, taking it and moving it around and making it suit or fit uh, that which we would like for it to suit or fit. And I pray, God, you would help us to avoid that tonight. Um, so easy to lean on our own understanding. That's why you had to tell us not to. And so we commit this evening into your hands. And we ask in Jesus' name that you would be kind enough to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Amen. All right. Well, uh, good to see. Thank you, Kendall. Praying for Donna. That is that is appreciated, definitely. Okay. Well, we are definitely... <laughs> uh, last week was a little bit, a little bit uh, weird, but... Uh, um, but anyways, uh, we de definitely have the study guide. It was posted uh, probably two or three days ago at this point. So um, we are on the uh, triumphant entry. Uh, we only got one A, I think, done. Uh, or, well, rather the first part of one. And then we have A, B, and C underneath of that that we have to do yet. So we're going to pick up again uh, reading. To refresh our memory, Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. So I invite you to join me as I grab my very old Bible. I had this since I was three. I've said that before, but I like to say it because I was a, a little thing then. But uh, looking at uh, verses 1 through 11, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Beth page unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus uh, two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village, and uh, see over against you, and straightway ye shall find a, an uh, ass tied, and a colt, and with her, with her loose, oh, and 
Is it tight with her? Okay. I'm sorry, my my red writing is washing out in the light. Okay. Loose her and bring them unto me. And if anyone uh, ought say ought unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And uh, straightway he will send them. Uh, all this was done that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet saying tell you the daughter of zion behold the king cometh unto thee meek and sitting on an ass and the colt the full of an ass and the disciples went and did as jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put them on their clothes put on them their clothes and let see and uh, set him thereon and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way uh, saying hosanna uh, what Okay, Don is helping me out here because my eyes skipped. Okay. Go back to verse eight. Huh? Go back to verse eight. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and uh, that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come unto Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. All right, sorry about that. Um, my glasses, no matter how much I wash them, are still a little bit smudgy. And uh, the light in here is such that the sun from outside is directly beating on the page and it made it just hard to read and i apologize for that okay so we already talked about uh, what do we learn about miracles from the donkey's colt and what we learn about miracles there in in a summation here what we learn about miracles is that miracles come about when we obey god um Jesus gives the disciples a command. The disciples simply obey the command. Jesus gives them details even as to what to do in the midst of, the, of their act of obedience. And this act of obedience yields a miraculous encounter which uh, produces... Um, <laughs> hey, Jen, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Jen and John, <laughs> or from John specifically. Okay, it's good to see you, John. Uh, miss you, by the way. Um, anyways, uh, the the uh, obedience that comes by faith is the uh, is the key to the entire book of Romans. Uh, that's the the phrase opens the book. The phrase closes the book, and um, most of everything that you and I do is simply an act of obedience that yields miraculous things. Examples in the scripture. Moses is told to stick his staff out over the water. He does. God splits the water, divides the Red Sea. And God uh, gives them dry land to walk across, and they walk through the midst of the sea. But all Moses did was obey God and stick his staff out. That's all he did. He didn't do anything else. Um, example, uh, Gideon, uh, Gideon follows God and God takes 32,000 men, turns them into 300 men, then takes the 300 men. And this is all through obedience, positions them around a ravine. And they, uh, at the middle of the night, they break their pitchers, they light their torches, they blow their trumpets, they shout and the whole valley is filled with the noise and 135,000 Midianites, uh, kill each other and flee. And um, another example, um, the things that David did, for instance, uh, David obeyed the Lord. The, 
the things that uh, that were accomplished through David. Um, one of my favorite ones, uh, just to note, is when he's going up against the Philistines and he asks the Lord, should we go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into our hand? And God says, yes, I'll do that. So they go up, they fight, they win the battle, but then the Philistines regroup. Now, David could have easily stayed with the original plan, but David asks again, okay, now what should we do? Should we go up against them again? And God says, when you hear the sound of the angels marching through the tops of the mulberry trees, you'll know I've gone out ahead of you, and then you can go. Now, if David had not prayed a second time and had not been an obedient servant, why then the uh, the disaster that could have ensued, but it didn't because of David's prayerfulness and of David's willingness to put God first and to demonstrate before everybody that he's an obedient servant, even though he's a king. And so uh, these are examples, just a few, of an entire book full of stories where God tells men something to do. They just do what they were told, and then wonderful things happen as a result of their obedience, but not not because the men were clever, not because the men were were uh, trying to get something done. So when we get to, to A here, uh, why did Jesus do this? What did it accomplish? Uh, Jesus did what he did according to Jesus' own testimony. He did what he did because it was what the Father told him to do. Now, this is what he said. He said, I only do what my Father tells me. And he says, I, I'm don't, I don't come in my own name. I come in the name of my Father. Uh, he is very, very careful to be sure that it's understood that what he is doing is working as an agent of, obe of the Father through obedience. And that's all that he is doing. He's made that clear. That's exactly what... Now, why is that so important? Well, because if anybody had the ability to invent something and make it happen, Jesus would have been the guy. Okay, he had all of the power and all the authority that God could ever give. He was the son of God in spirit. He was the son of man in the flesh. And he could have done anything. He could have, he could have made up any idea. He could have, uh, uh, have put together any plan and made it happen. Now, it's not simply that Jesus read in the scripture that there was a prophecy about the king entering into Jerusalem, riding on the colt, the foal of a donkey, the foal of a, as the, <laughs> as the King James puts it, an ass. Okay. That's not why he's doing this. He's not going, hmm, oh, there's scripture that needs to be fulfilled. Well, this is the time, I think, to fulfill it. Uh, so this is what we're going to do, fellas. Here's this plan. And if you go and now if somebody happens to see this, just tell them the Lord needs it. And don't worry, they'll go along with it. No, that's not what's going on here. Jesus is telling the disciples to do exactly what the Father has told Jesus to do. So the disciples do what Jesus told them. Jesus is telling the disciples what God the Father told him to, to say. In the meantime, why here comes this whole fulfillment of a prophecy, Matthew notes, that, uh, that comes about. And it says, now here in the questions, it says, well, well, what did this accomplish? It accomplished the will of God. That's what it accomplished. For all of the analysis that we might do as to why did he ride in on the full of cold of a donkey and oh it was humble oh it was this oh it was that maybe it was maybe it was all of these things but none of it is the why none of it is the motivation none of it is the cause the reason or the effect what it is is simply an obedient servant doing an obedient thing Okay, Jesus had every right to write in on whatever he wanted to write in on. And you say, well, yes, but he was such a humble man that he chose to write in on a donkey's colt. 
that's not the reason. Was he humble? Sure, he was humble. Sure, you're right. You're right. He was humble. I mean, that's what the Bible says, right? Philippians chapter 2. Let the Spirit be within you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but took upon himself the nature of a servant. Okay, so so we know that, that yes, he was a humble servant. Yes, he was an obedient servant. But if humility is what you're driving at, well, then there's no point. Humility is nothing. Without obedience, humility is nothing. It's just it, it's just an attitude. And attitudes come and they go. Okay? It, the whole point here is obeying. The whole point is doing the will of the Father. Now, the Father does what he's going to do. But he wants you to obey him. But your obedience is is not the same thing as God's invention. God doesn't need your invention to help him. He doesn't need your advice. He doesn't need your counsel. The Bible has said this. Who has who, who has known the mind of the Lord that he should counsel him? Romans chapter 11. We read it at the end of our services every Sunday. Uh, took up this thing of reading the uh, Romans doxology because the Romans doxology in chapter 11 is packed with theology and if i can achieve anything over the next year it's to take that romans doxology and to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it as a congregation so many times that whenever people begin to think uh you know oh does god know what's going on does god know if he, does he love me does he care about you know there won't be any question in their minds because that doxology will be something they've repeated so many times that that now it's it's just it's in their heads it's in their hearts it's something that they've got memorized you know some folks may be wondering why I even started doing that well there there you go I just I, I let my whole motivation out it's because I love you and it's because I love God that's the reason so why did people welcome him as king uh, were they being pretentious? Why did they welcome him as king? Well, first of all, um, the people that are that that were throwing their coats over the donkey for Jesus to sit on were disciples. Second of all, the people that were cutting down branches, most of them were disciples. Others of them were people that were, if you will, followers in a sense. Um, not followers as disciples, but people that followed him around because they wanted to see what he would do next. And so when they saw the disciples, the ones who actually were connected to him, throwing down palm branches and spreading cloaks on the ground and all of this, they just simply joined in until a whole crowd of people was getting into this thing, throwing down branches, throwing down garments, and shouting, Hosanna, son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it just kind of becomes a crowd-fueled uh, ecstasy that people are engaged in in some cases. In other cases, they were doing it because they believed that they knew who Jesus was and why he was there. You'll note very clearly that the disciples were not connected with the idea that he was here as the Passover lamb. So, here we have Jesus on the colt of a donkey, and he's coming in at Passover. You'll remember that back in John chapter 7, it was Succoth. This is, all, this is just six months earlier, and he refused to come in through the front door <coughs> at Succoth. The reason is because Succoth was the time where they remembered God living and dwelling within their midst in the desert. <clears throat> and it pointed to a future time when God would once again dwell among them. And Jesus could not come through the front door. He came in through a back way, secretly, as the Bible says. Okay, and the reasoning was even though the Bible doesn't give us the reasoning, when we take a look at the context, we can easily see what the likely reason is. And I say likely reason almost euphemistically because I'm certain it's the reason. 
But, you know, can I show you the scripture and verse where it spells this out? No, of course not. Of course not. I can show you the context. I can show you the general context of the festivals, the general context of the law. I can show you the general context of the overarching narrative of the scripture. I can show you the general context of Jesus' obedience and why he does what he does is through obedience. I can show you all of these things, clear down to the fact that I have to now act as a detective, and I have to say there's a reason why he wouldn't come in the front gate, but he came in the back door. Okay, and the reason is because this wasn't the time. But when the time came six months later, at Passover, he came in through the front gate not as the God who had come to dwell with the people, but the lamb that had come to be slaughtered for their sacrifice to save them from their sins. Now he's able to come through the front door because this is the purpose. This is the reason. Why is he on the, full, the, the, the cult? Because he is being presented in a dynamic way to the people this is the lamb. Now, is it really to the people when I say that? In a sense, yes. In a sense, no. Okay, in a sense, yes, because he's there to take away their sins. Okay, in a sense, no, because he's not there because of them. He's there because of God the Father and what God the Father is wanting to do. So to sum this up, to sum this up, this story of the triumphant entry, um, this is not, and this is not uh, Jesus uh, doing what doing what he read in the scripture and trying to make it happen. If that was the case, and God had left him to his own inventiveness, uh, if this were any other man, the timing would have been off. Okay, it would have been off no matter what. But this is the exact right time. Why? Because. God the Father knows exactly when things have to happen, exactly when they have to come about. We just saw this as we studied the death of Lazarus and his resurrection. Okay, there is, there is a very, very specific timetable. And if we don't do what God is telling us to do and we get all inventive and all of this, God will take everything that we do and make it amount to nothing. Even if at first it's a big splash in the pan, it's going to come to nothing in the end. Okay, but if we do exactly what God is telling us to do, and if we're willing to wait on God until it's the right time for God to, to move, why then if we're waiting on him and doing the right thing, dynamic things are going to happen, and only through obedience. Sometimes it's just simply going to be the obedience of you calling somebody when God asks you to call. Or it's going to be the obedience of you, uh, you know, saying something when when an appropriate word is needed. Um, but it could be something as dynamic as sticking your staff out over the water. Oh, how, what a dynamic thing God asked Moses to do. You know, you remember this, maybe you do, maybe you don't, I don't know. The story of Elisha when... Um, um, goodness sakes, I had his name in my mind. Amaziah uh, had come to him and asked, uh, you know, if there was any word from the Lord. And Elisha said, well, first bring me a harpist or, <clears throat> and, or, and there was somebody that came and played music and uh, helped to calm Elisha's mind and heart. And uh, then he said to Amaziah, take these arrows and strike the ground. And uh, this was, I believe, the Ammonites or, or Aramites that were coming against him. And he struck the ground three times because he had no idea what in the world Elisha was asking. And Elisha said, no, 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 no. You only struck the ground three times. You should have just kept striking the ground until I told you to stop. And now that, now that you just struck it only three times, he says, God's only gonna de going to deliver you for three years. And then after that, he's going to let the Aramites have their way. And he gets, he just gets very, very upset with, uh, with Amaziah because of, of what he does. Now you and I take a look and I go, well, I would probably have stuck the ground three times, maybe even once. I wouldn't have known what in the world was expected of me. Nobody actually told me, 
But the thing is, you see, that that, uh, the obedience that comes by faith is always the standard. And Elisha hadn't said stop. He said beat the ground with them. That's what he had said. Now, if he had just kept beating the ground, and even if it was to infinity, um, it, it would have mattered a whole lot more than him stopping when he thought it was an appropriate time to stop. And did Amaziah have the knowledge to do that? No, probably not. Uh, did, should he have kept obeying? That's what God wanted. Uh, did God inform him of that? No, not really. But did God show a pattern in the past that obedience that comes by faith was what was required? Yes. Was Amaziah smart enough to see it? Probably no, because he was not a he was not a righteous man. He was a sinful man. And so the story goes that uh, that he beat it three times instead of just keep continuing to obey. What we have here in this story of the triumphant entry is the right time, the right place, the right command, a simple thing that Jesus was told to do, get on the colt, ride it into town, okay? But for God, this was God's way of taking the lamb and placing him gently upon the colt of a donkey and bringing that lamb humbly into the city that Jesus had avoided other than festivals. He had avoided it. Most of his ministry was in Galilee. Only the last six months of his ministry was around Jerusalem, and that's it. And so two and a half years, he's in Galilee and surrounding areas up there, but only in that last six months. And there's reasoning for that, but we'll get to it eventually. Okay, let's take a look at Luke's account, uh, which is 19 verses 28 to 44. We're going to take a look at that because this last question here uh, specifically addresses what Luke says. So we're going to take Luke and uh, chapter 19. And then we're going to look at, this is going to have some repetition from what we've already read, but 28 to 44, so that we have... Uh, the fullness of the story. Starting at 28. um, And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass that when he was come nigh to Bethpage and to Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, uh, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye unto the village over against you, in the which uh, at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereof ye never, whereof never man sat. Uh, loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask of you, why do ye loose him? Thou shalt say unto him, Because the Lord uh, hath need of him. And they went, uh, let's see, and they were they were sent, went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And on their way, and uh, as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought unto Jesus, and cast their garments on the colt, and he sat, and they sat Jesus thereon. And uh, they went and spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now all the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all his mighty works that were that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that even if they should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. 
And when Jesus was come out, uh, he beheld the city and went over to it, saying, saying, uh, If thou had known, even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong in unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep there in keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave up uh, not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he went to the temple and began to cast them out uh, solid there, that sold therein. Did I say to 48? You said 44. To 44, okay. 48, okay, 44 though. Okay, so here in Luke, and uh, this is in Luke only, uh, Luke says that Jesus spoke a warning to Jerusalem. And uh, what does that mean? Well, First of all, he says to Jerusalem that uh, the time of the visit of their visitation had come. In other words, that the Messiah that they were looking for, the one that they wanted to come, the one they wanted to visit, his presence upon them was present. That is him, and that they they didn't know it. It was hidden from thee. It says, hid from thee. What does that mean? That means that they had eyes but could not see and ears that could not hear. Now this is something that is repeated over and over again. From the time that it's issued first in Isaiah 6.6, 6, it is repeated throughout the scripture. Jesus repeats it two or three times. Paul repeats it three or four times. It is repeated over and over again. This is the reason given repeatedly as to why people can be presented the clear and concise gospel and it just right over their heads. They just don't get it. They just don't get it. They, they can be told over and over and over again and they just don't get it because, because as the prophecy said, make the minds of these people dull, give them eyes but never seen and ears but never hearing lest they would repent and I would save them. And uh, God has blinded the eyes of the people. He's blinded the ears of the people intentionally to keep them from coming to terms with God on their own terms. In other words, God does not want anybody saved on their own terms. God wants them saved on God's terms. And so God has reserved the power of conversion to a miraculous event where, a, where a, a dead spirit comes alive, where he is justified and the justification of Jesus is applied to that person. That person puts their faith in God and they continue in a relationship of grace and faith throughout their, the rest of their lives, growing in sanctification until the day of their glorification when salvation is finally in their hand. And up until then, it's not in their hand. They have to walk by faith in a promise of salvation. Now, you and I, we walk by faith in a promise of salvation. But the miraculous thing is that we were converted in order for us to do this. In other words, we were born again. In other words, we were regenerated. In other words, we were brought to life. Okay, so however you, you want to biblically describe it, all three of those terms describe it. The dead brought to life, uh, a person being born again, and then the other uh, being that uh, you've been regenerated or you've been quickened. Okay, so we have, we have here this, this fantastic story 
that is uh, a story of a miraculous event. And some have argued, and I agree with them, that this salvation of a soul is more impossible than the uh, than the creation of the universe because the possibility of something that's dead coming back to life is in is insurmountably uh, difficult in fact the scripture lays out in the old testament the impossibility of the very thing that Jesus did. And Jesus did it through one means, and that is this one law that came before the fall of man, that supersedes the fall of man, and that is the law of marriage. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave only to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. In this particular case, the two is the bridegroom, Jesus, and the bride, the church. And so the bridegroom and the bride become one flesh before God. Now the scripture tells us that this is such that, uh, and this is uh, Exodus in chapter, uh, hard pressed, 1921, I think, chapter 19, verse 21. No, no, it's earlier than that. 21 verse nine, maybe but it's, it's in that territory. Um, anyways, I had memorized it, but right now I can't recall it for some reason. But in that particular passage, it says that if a man has a slave woman and he wishes to give her to his son as a wife, he must give her the rights of a daughter. So you and I are that slave woman. We're the bride. We're the church. We're the slave woman. And, and, and God wishes to give us to his son, Jesus, okay? So by his own law, and this is always lawful, God did not supersede the law in order to save us. No, instead he fulfilled the law. He's both the just and the justifier. So he's just because he fulfills the law and he's the justifier because he, he brings us into his own fulfillment. And so what we have here is this slave woman, the church, being given to God's son. And so God, who has this slave woman, the church, because the Bible says all souls belong to God, as the soul of the father, so the soul of the son, and the soul that sinneth it shall die. And therefore all souls belong to God. Therefore the church belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the devil, it belongs to God. And so God takes his slave woman, gives it to his son, Okay, I say it because it's the church, but gives the church, her, let's say, to his son, and by his own law, he must give us the rights of a daughter, which is what the scripture means in Galatians chapter 4, when it says that we have the adoption of sonship. So we have actually been adopted by God. We have been brought from slavery into freedom. We have been brought from from death to life, we have been brought from strangers to children, we have been brought from paupers to princes, we have been brought from, from the, the, the pit of sin into the heavenly realm, and we have been taken from uh, a complete bereft state to a, to a state of total inheritance, with Christ of everything that Christ is inheriting. And God, the Bible says, has even made us co-regents with him. And that means that, as the scripture says, Revelation 3.21, that uh, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, even as I sit with my father upon his throne. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the visitation of the eternal one. And the eyes of the people are closed, the ears are closed, and they would not to have them open. They had no will to do it. They had no interest in opening their eyes and their ears. And God demonstrates it clearly. 
Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. The Bible says in more than one place, everybody that came to Christ was healed, delivered. Demons were cast out. So many things happened, so many miracles. And the Pharisees kept saying stupid things to Jesus, like, uh, give us a sign. Are you truly the Messiah? Then give us a sign. It's like, what do you mean, give us a sign? It's all over the place. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no sign will be given this adulterous and wicked generation except the sign of Jonah, who was in the belly of the whale for three days and afterwards was spit up on the beach. And what does he mean by that? He means, he means look, here's the scripture. He doesn't mean, hey, look at all my miracles. He says, look at the scripture. Now, here we have just stuff that just blows our minds because as Christians, we've had our eyes opened and we've had our ears open and we look around and we go, you know, it's like uh, some folks that, that have been saved under my ministry, um, not because of me, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying I happen to be lucky enough to be there when they were saved. That's what I mean. But I've had more than one that have said to me after they got saved, why isn't this church full of people? Why aren't there people everywhere? Oh, I just, there's so much love in this room. And the thing is, what has happened is their eyes were open, their ears were open, their hearts were opened. And now all of a sudden they see clearly what always was there the whole time. But when they got saved, all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, look at all, why aren't there more people here? And you know what? When I was saved, I had the same reaction. When I was first saved, I said, man, I've got to tell everybody about this. i got to let everybody in the world know about this. And I just told people and told people and told people and people had reactions, you know, like, okay, all right, get out of here, beat it, to, oh, I see you had a religious experience, to, uh, the, to, to even... One that just that that just said, uh, you know, that my enthusiasm was just because I was a kid and an idealist, and I went through this constant battering just simply because I I was like so amazed that God could be so great, and He was being presented as so small, and it just astounded me. That, that this was going on all around me. I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. Now, believe me, everyone who has had their eyes opened and their ears opened and their heart opened to God, it's like waking up. Now, there was, a, there was a song written by Randy Stonehill and Keith Green that addresses that called uh, uh, Until Your Love Broke Through. And um, in, in a sense... In a sense, they're, they're telling you the, the clear and true story. In a sense, they, they misunderstood. They misunderstood what exactly happened uh, as if God's love was always there and it just took, took it a while to get through their thick skulls. And that's really not exactly what happened according to the scripture. According to the scripture, it was God that touched them. He opened their eyes, opened their ears, opened their hearts, and in that sense, the love of God broke through. And it's a beautiful song. If you get a chance to listen to it, you can look it up on YouTube. I'm sure it's there until your love broke through. It's a great song. Um, anyway, though, uh, here we have Jesus coming into Jerusalem. He's the Passover lamb on a donkey. He's riding in, and then he pauses when he gets, uh, when he's coming down the, the, the slope of, the Mount of Olives and getting ready to, to head up the slope into the city. He just looks at the city and he says, he says, uh, you know, if you'd only knew, known the visitation, your time of visitation is here. <laughs> and he says, he says, but it was hidden from you and you didn't know it. And then he talks about what's going to happen in 70 AD when the Romans will attack Jerusalem. The time of their judgment has come. God has given them an opportunity in their own flesh without his help, but he's still given them an opportunity 
to receive Christ, to embrace him, and, and to welcome him as king, but instead he is exactly as God presents him, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, which is what John the Baptist said of him the first day that Jesus began his public ministry. So here we see it clearly in the scripture. Everything that is happening, the, 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 the prophecy that's happening, the reason that it's happening, this isn't some cleverly designed attempt to get people to notice Jesus because it was hidden from them what was going on. It, was, it, was, it didn't make any sense to them. They didn't see it. And even so, his apostles and his disciples did not even understand it. And the scripture makes it clear in the book of John that that was indeed the case. Uh, looking at the time, okay, we're going to continue. Um, discuss cleansing number two and cleansing number one. What's similar, what's different, and why are why are they two cleansings? Okay, well, we're just going to go ahead and continue from math, from uh, Luke, since we're already here anyways. Verses 45 to 48. Uh, so we're going to pick up, back up with verse 45. And he went to the temple and began to cast them out that sold therein, and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple and the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him and could not find what they might do for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Now let's move over to John chapter two, which is not too many pages from where we are. And we're going to look at uh, verses 13 to 25. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Chapter 2, verses uh, 13 to 25. So, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the, the changers, of the money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath uh, eaten me up. And then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered unto them, uh, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then, Jesus, then said the Jews, uh, Forty and six years this temple was... Uh, was this temple in building, and wilt thou tear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body, and when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, the the first overturning of the money changers table. It comes at Passover, yes, but it doesn't come after the, uh, after the triumphant entry. Triumphant entry in John is recorded way, way up in chapter 12. Okay, so John is clear because uh, he says the next day, the next day, the next day. He's very clear at the very beginning. He wants us to understand. Now, what, what had happened here with Jesus is that there had been the wedding in Cana and he had gone down to uh, the wilderness and had and been tempted. And when he comes back up, uh, he stops off in Jerusalem. And uh, when he stops off in Jerusalem, he finds the money changers tables, which had been there before 
We're still there. There's there now. They're going to be there later in the story. But he tears it apart and he says to them something different than what he says at the end. Yes, it's to be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a house of merchandise. Now he starts out mild. You've made it a house of merchandise. At the end of his ministry, he makes it harsher. You've made it a den of thieves. At first, it's just a house of merchandise. And Jesus is giving them forbearance and he's giving them patience. He's being gracious with them. He's giving them time to get things in straight. Now is the time of their visitation. And he comes right out and he says, you've made it a den of thieves. Twice he has overturned the money changers tables. He bookends his ministry with this activity that the church, that is the temple, is to be a place of prayer. Now, the modern temple today, according to the scripture, is the church. The church collectively is the temple of God, and individually uh, we also share in that we're like living stones being stacked one on the other, uh, measured off the cornerstone. Uh, we are... Uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, such and such. And you've heard you've heard these people talking, mm -hmm. your body is a temple and you need to treat it with healthy things and all that. And they try to try to take the scripture and and you know they kind of uh, uh, hijack it to make it mean what they want it to mean. You, you don't have the right to do that. No, what the scripture means is that we are individually part of the temple and collectively we are the temple of God. The modern temple is the church in which the Holy Spirit dwells. Okay, and that's who we are. Now, we're not only the temple, but we're also a royal priesthood and a kingdom of priests. Okay, so, so there's so much more about the identity of people who have been converted by God. And this kind of helps us to understand why it is that God reserves conversion to himself. Because you can't have profane people just walking in, claiming to be Christians, claiming to have all of this identity that the church is given, just simply because they've decided to nod their head. Well, no. No, if you're going to be what the Bible says God has made us into, then the entry gate, the narrow gate into this is Jesus. And you must be converted to get through the gate. You can't get through the gate in your own effort. Now that's, that's just simply what the scripture says. Now, can anybody, is anybody a potential, um, a potential candidate for salvation? That's always the question that's asked. Well, salvation is universally available, but atonement is limited. In other words, God makes the offer to everybody, but those that he actually converts and helps are limited to those that he converts and helps, uh, however many that is and however great that is. But those that are not saved that have heard the gospel they're not saved for the same reason that the people of Jerusalem did not know the day of their visitation because they have eyes but cannot see. They have ears that can, but cannot hear. And so this, this takes away the, this uh, idea that, that uh, this is some big kind of club that we're just trying to get people to join and we're trying to get them to nod their head and we're trying then to disciple goats into sheep, and we're trying to disciple tares into wheat, we, we, we just can't do that. It just doesn't happen. I mean, no matter what you do to a tear, it's still a tear. No matter how you train a goat, it's still a goat. I can tame a cat so that a cat can live in my house with relatively little damage but I can't ever get rid of its catness. Uh, its its nature will always be cat. 
no matter how much I've trained it. A dog, I can train a dog to live in the house with relatively little damage. But no matter how much I've trained the dog, it can't get rid of its dogness. In the same sense, I can take a sinner and I can teach and train a sinner to be religious and I can teach and train a sinner to live in the, in the church and with the people of God with relatively little damage and I can, I can make them into good citizens so that they have relatively little damage in the community, but I can't get rid of the sin nature. And this is the problem, you see, because, because we've got plenty of religious people who have been trained to behave religiously and have never been converted. Now, are we doing them a favor or are we not doing them a favor, I guess, is the question here. Because if all we are concerned about is this life, perhaps we are doing them a favor. Perhaps we are training them how to be better people and teaching them to at least have some kind of reverence for God. Okay, and maybe in that sense, we are helping them. But are we helping them in the eternal sense by giving them the idea that all they need to do is train themselves to behave in a religious fashion so that they might please God, whatever that means in this context, and then would somehow step into heaven one day because they had learned how to be really good people and religious. We're not really helping them in that case. In that case, we're deceiving them. And uh, this is not right. You, you cannot deceive people uh, and expect that because they are convinced that they're going to go to heaven, that they'll go to heaven. You, you, can't, you can't do that. Um, one of the greatest deceptions that we're struggling with right now is this deception that uh, religion as it stands is okay and whatever religion happens to be in the next generation will still be okay. That's a great deception. In this particular case, Jesus finds religion at the beginning and at the end. He finds it in three years to have actually intensified from where it's a house of merchandise to where it's a house, uh, to, to where it's a den of thieves. Uh, he sees, he, he sees that, that uh, the, the, the reasoning behind things hasn't changed. The religion hasn't changed. For all the miracles that he did for three years and people from Jerusalem were going out to Galilee to see. Every, the Pharisees were chasing him around. The scribes were chasing him around. They wanted to see what was going on. But none that they saw, nothing that they experienced, for all that they had seen and all that Jesus had done, and the disciples themselves, even Judas, who himself did miracles and wonders, God performed them at Judas's hand. And Judas still didn't get it and betrayed Christ. For all of this, we see that there is no, no clear demonstration that men, having been trained by religion, become anything else other than religious sinners. And that's what we see. And none of us really, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, to labor for all of my life to deceive people. I want to labor all of my life to give them the truth, even though they don't want to hear it, and even though it upsets them, and even though the, essentially the truth tells them that they cannot get into heaven on their own merit, that it's more than just not a nod of the head. It's a pleading with God for the, for the changing of a soul, for the deliverance of the nature, for changing one from a sinner into a saint, a whole new nature. That, friends, is the great miracle of salvation. Now, we're going to have to continue on uh, to 2a when we get together next week. And we still have another page besides. Isn't that fun? I'm so excited. I am so excited. Well, I really enjoyed being with you tonight and... And I trust 
that you will continue uh, to come to the Bible studies. Uh, these live ones are the next one. They're the fresh one. But I'm telling you what, well, we've got a ton of them behind us. This is number 91 in the installments on the gospel, which means that there are 90 others that you could be accessing and enjoying right now. Uh, they're they're on Facebook, but they're, most of what you're going to find is going to be on our uh, church's website. They're all in a nice list, and uh, you can get to that church's website simply by going to the homepage of Mount Carmel United Brethren in Christ and looking down in our info, and there will be the link to the church's website, okay? Um, let's bow our heads together for a word of prayer. Merciful Father, all of us want to be with you. We want to be saved. And I know, Lord, that you said this, that all your father has, he would bring to you. And of all those that came to you, not one of them would be turned away. And so, God, if we have been brought to you by the father indeed, we have the assurance we will not be turned away. But we do plead with you, Lord, for miraculous intervention and for the salvation of our souls, the changing of our hearts and minds, the changing of our lives, that what lays ahead of us, Lord, would be a life of eternal glory rather than the common death of all men, the casting into the lake of fire. God, oh, we dread such knowledge. We would rather not even know about it. But Lord, if we didn't, then we wouldn't realize the desperate situation that we are in. Lord, you sent us to seek and to save that which was lost. Help us to continue to do that. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for all of you who stu stood with us this whole time, or those of you that joined us and never said boo. That's all right. Uh, we love you. God bless you. Have a good day. Uh, evening and we'll see you next week unless of course you watch our service on